Well, welcome everybody to our community call. It's the first one of March. We got a long month, so I think we get another one at the the last week here. Um, we've got a lot to go through today, so we're going to jump right in. So we'll do the usual agenda with the overview. Um, I want to make sure that we get plenty of time to have the board observers uh, present or talk or answer any questions. Uh, Dermot's going to do some market liquidity. We'll get some product updates from Shane. We'll get a nice uh, we'll get a nice uh, report from the Builders Lego Mixer from Eat Denver from Ads. And then give you a little recap of what happened at the PNF offsite before we went to um, Eat Denver, which was a couple of weeks ago. So jumping right in, I uh, just want to do a couple of quick shout outs. So Merdad, who's uh, here today, has been doing a lot of great work for us on the back end. He's been really helpful for um, the new creds work that we're doing and filling a lot of gaps. So just a big shout out from Ben specifically, but from the whole foundation for all the work that you've been doing and the ways you've been helping him block us. So Appreciate you. Thanks, Murdad. I also want to do a shout out to the other quick grant recipients that we've had. Um, I've been asking you guys to do a bunch of different small tasks and play with uh, new things like Karma Gap and some other tools. And I appreciate you all stepping up and jumping in and doing that. It's been really helpful to get that feedback from you all. I'm going to give 15 seconds here. If anybody else has any other shout outs they want to give out for work going on, especially in the background this last month. Like the Jeopardy theme song's gotta gotta get added to the the soundboard. Happy to unmute. Um, Ads will talk about it later, but I think we we ran a really cool event in Denver that got a lot of great feedback. And also a second shout out. Not trying to uh, overdo it on the ads front, but um, I, th I thought the discussion yesterday um, around AI, I guess, was really well facilitated by Ads One. But also, I thought the input and participation from the community was just really great. I mean, I think everyone was super reasonable, super thoughtful. Um, it was a really good example of actually everyone coming together, bringing their different perspectives. And actually, I think everyone left a little bit smarter and more enlightened. So I thought that was uh, was great. So that was more of a, a thank you and shout out to the community. Thanks, Dermot. Yeah, I'll second that. And the recording from yesterday's call, um, Jerry, Jerry was doing some moving, but it should be online later today um, or early tomorrow with the latest. But I've dropped a transcript that you all can read through if anybody wants to go back and review that call because they weren't able to attend it yesterday. All right, I'm going to give it another beat if anybody else has any other shout outs. Great. Well, thank you all for showing up and for all that you do for us. We appreciate you. Jumping into some announcements. So we have two DAO proposals up. Uh, the DAO appointed board observer, which we're going to chat about right after this. Um, make sure you go in and, and vote for who you'd like to be our observer. And then PUP33, which is uh, Scale Parameters and Capacity for Evolution by Olshansky and Ramiro, which deals with some um, block size issues in the current, um, the current protocol. Uh, make sure you go in and vote for that. Shane, I, I see on the call with Ramiro, I don't know if any of you, oh, and Olshansky, do you guys want to give a quick like overview of PUP33? Is there anything that you want to make sure people understand before they vote? Uh, I did put uh, a little bit of detail uh, in my slide. Uh, so, yeah, but, Great. you know, basically it's just doing, um, it's increasing the block size and it's uh, increasing the minimum amount of proofs needed, which will uh, partially clean up uh, some of the, you know, uh, some of the block size. Uh, natively, but then also adding to the block size uh, will then allow us to scale into Shannon. Yeah, just to add uh, just yeah. a little more detail before Shane goes into all the technical details, uh, we really need this in order to one, enable more gateways and to enable more services and block things on Mort until we get to Shannon. And please do take a look because we need to get it out sooner rather than later um, to avoid any potential issues on the network. Yeah, I, I, so I do want to try next to... topic. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry, Ramiro. I just wanted to, to add that the effects that we'll see is just a very, very slight reduction in in relays, 
like 1% of the total network, so not much. And also I want to make sure that PNF knows <laughs> mostly that we now have a, a formula to calculate how much block space will any other gateway consume that uh, so given the number of apps that the new gateways will have we can calculate the worst case scenario for all of those and make sure that we can keep on adding gateways without knowing what will happen so that's important Oops, did the opposite. Thanks, Ramiro. Um, that's awesome to hear. And Dermot, just so everybody knows, that vote is up today. Uh, I just went up this morning, so people can vote right now if they want to. All right, I'm going to run through the forum stuff here. So um, Dermot touched on this, but we had a discussion in the discussion forum the about forum. AI, and we and we also have a a uh, sorry, uh, we also have a Discord channel for that. And if you're not in that conversation, please join in if you have opinions. Um, obviously, this is your DAO. We need more input from you all on what you want to do. And we're, I think the next step here is we're looking for a Tiger team to go ahead and start thinking about how we, um, how we take this forward. Dermot's going to talk a little bit about the Tier 1 liquidity. Uh, that's coming up shortly. Uh, space, obviously, we just heard a little about that. Shane will give us some more in a bit. Um, B1 economics governance R&D is complete. So block science finished that. Dermot, do you want to say anything about that? Nothing more than what's in the forum. Um, it's obviously pretty complex. And obviously where we're at isn't, doesn't exactly map to the immediate Morse economics. So I think it's a good time for people to get up to speed and also to essentially start putting forward some of their own ideas for improvements. Um, I've spoken to a couple of teams this week who are already getting deeper into pocket economics and already thinking about potential optimizations and ways to improve um, the economics. That's great. So I think the more people thinking and sharing ideas about this, the better. So that's uh, all I have for now. Um, but yeah, thank you for raising it. Zach. Great. Thanks, Dermot. Um, and then ads, I'm going to do the same for you. I see Blockworks has put up a co-sponsorship -sp request. Um, I don't know if you want to talk any about that or just move people to the forum. Um, given how much we have to get through today, I won't take up any time on the call with that. But if anybody has questions, feel free to ping me or drop your comments on the forum. Yeah, definitely go to the forum for that one. Um, I think there's only one comment, which is from you, Ad, so we'd love more engagement. Okay, moving on to the announcements. So most of you have probably heard that Send Wallet and Send Nodes is shutting down all staking and operations. Um, at this point, if you were staking with them, your fund should have been returned to your wallet. Um, please do not do any new staking or unstaking in the app. And if you do need more information, they're still active in their Telegram uh, and taking support requests. So jump in there if you have any questions. And then I just want to call out that um, Peter has created a node run request in Discord. Um, we just launched it today. So if anybody's having any kinks, definitely let us know. But the idea here is it's just a small like, hey, I'm interested in being a node runner. How do I learn a little bit about it before I jump in and start asking questions? Um, and so it should be very lightweight and more of a, a gate to, um, you know, for new users or people just interested in learning about what Pocket does. Uh, we would definitely appreciate some feedback. And the idea would be to roll this out for a couple other pieces of the ecosystem uh, to see if maybe running a new gateway, we can get people onboarded lightly before we do that. So feedback is very welcome at this point. All right, that's it for the announcements. Jumping over to board observers. I'm going to hand it off to you, Dermot. Awesome. And yeah, I think the first thing to say is that from a PNF perspective, it was amazing. I'm sure many people in the community are feeling this too, to see so many great, talented and passionate people put their names forward to take on more responsibility and to help Pocket Ecosystem through this new mechanism of the board observer. So I'm sure most of you have seen the post or the vote, but to kind of step, step back, the DAO is voting on who they want to represent them on the PNF board as an observer. And really the role of an, an observer is to be in the room where it happens. So they can do two things primarily. Um, one is to, to be there to help positively influence and shape 
ecosystem strategy and execution, and then to also communicate with the DAO about these decisions, which provides a another point of contact, another method in which they may communicate, and it just really helps grow our ecosystem and increase our talent density. And um, so there's six candidates up for voting. We have CryptoCorn, Shane, Ramiro, Fred, Bowen, and Olshansky, all of whom I think are on this call. And voting runs for just under two more weeks. And so definitely not trying to have any kind of beauty parade or anything like that. And most of the names will actually be known to most of the community. But I, I think it'd be really great if all of the um, nominees just quickly introduce themselves, um, what they're doing and who they are and why they're interested in the role. I think that would be um, great. So I think um, if that works for everyone, I think we can just go down in that list in that order. And the, the order was chosen just simply when they posted on the forum. So if we start with CryptoGorn, then Shane and Ramiro and, and go down from there, if that works. Cool. Okay, you guys, you can hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Cool. All right. So let me jump in quickly. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I think that we have some really great candidates, especially on the technical side. So it's cool to see you know, some really great people there. Uh, for my role, why I think I would be good for this is I kind of want to bring more sort of the, the, the board observing part. So the actual observing part of how things run. And so I think sort of my candidacy, probably the strength of it, is I kind of want to bring a bit of oversight into what's going on. And that doesn't have to be sort of aggressive or antagonistic, but I think it's someone having a role of someone actually asking the tough questions. So finding out sort of when things do go wrong is why did they go wrong? And so I think I probably have the best demonstrated history of asking those questions, of standing up. And while the DAO sort of does have this role of sort of oversight of, of PNF, in actuality, either people have sort of have some kind of work for PNF or people aren't really interested, I think, in asking those questions. So I just kind of want to bring some kind of oversight to the DAO uh, and into PNF from, from my role. Um, I think there's a lot of technical people which, are, which should be great for technical roles. And I think we should also have a role for sort of investor relations and, and, and bring partnerships to, to, to Pocket. Um, I'm not sure if that partnership role should be a board observer. I think they're two very different things. Um, and certainly when, when not all the candidates are being able to spell the name of the company they're applying for correctly, uh, kind of shows the difference between observing something and being showing oversight versus sort of things like industry relations and industry partnerships. So, yeah, in short, I think I bring, bring oversight. Um, I think there's some really great technical people there to bring sort of the technical side. And I think we should also have a role for, for industry partnership, and I'd vote for that on top of this as well. So that's, that's me, CryptoCorn. Awesome. Thank you, CryptoCorn. Shane, if you're here, uh, love you to go Thanks. next. Cool. Uh, yeah, keep this short and brief. Uh, been in Pocket since 2019, uh, uh, working for uh, what was originally PNF. Um, more, more recently, I've been working with, uh, uh, I bet I was contracted out by uh, PNF to uh, to work with the protocol team and to do tokenomics and things of that nature uh, to prepare for Shannon. Uh, and so uh, that's kind of the, the state of where I am now. What I've been very passionate about is uh, building a holistic ecosystem, which is why I'm you know tickled pink to be able to be working on the tokenomics uh, side of things and to be working closely along with the, uh, the protocol team. Uh, but also, uh, also proper... Uh, proper processes. Uh, I've been a, a stickler in the DAO for, you know, having proper processes for how we disseminate information, how we, uh, you know, attribute value to things, uh, how we communicate. And so, uh, and so in my mind, uh, a board observer is, uh, you know, partially there to provide uh, knowledge and, and insight and expertise uh, to all, directly to those making decisions. But also to uh, be the uh, be a bridge between the the board and the uh, the DAO, and so uh, with kind of my my background within the DAO and helping uh, in the various areas within the DAO to to organize or to uh, uh, talk about votes, um, yeah, I would want to basically bring that same approach to the uh, to the board itself, so that the DAO is fully a part of what is going on. Uh, yeah, do, do what I can with what I already am basically doing, but in a more uh, direct capacity. 
Nice. Thank you, Shane. Uh, Romero, you're up next. OK. I didn't know I had to present myself like this, but well, I think most of the Pocket community know me uh, because I like to antagonize with everything that's a little bit technical out there. So I'm kind of a, an observer already of what's going on. Everything that touches the forum <laughs> gets my scrutiny <laughs> of, or some sorts of it. So I've been there analyzing every technical propose that has been put to the forum since BIP22, I think created a lot of debates, made uh, lots of written documents about pockets and tried to to bring some more data focused uh, decision making to, to the pocket community. So what I think that I can bring to the DAO as an observer is being there when decisions are being made. So being part of the conversation and being able to to know exactly what's going on. And before these things hit the, the community, to be able to, to provide feedback on, on anything that's being proposed. And, and my feedback is not only to try to bring down ideas. I, I, I tend to change my mind without much problem. What I like is to have that the DAO being run by data so that we can be sure that when we are taking a, making a decision, we are doing the right thing, not because we feel it, but because the data says that that's the correct decision. And that's, I think that's my value. I'm, I think that right now I'm almost an expert in Pocket. I've been all over the, the place in the Pocket code from the source to the data to the blocks. So. I've been there for all the tokenomics modeling. I, I, I have my hands everywhere, I think. I'm also part of the Shannon. I'm not actually working full time for the Shannon, but I've been part of the conversation for the Shannon, trying also to shape how the Shannon update will be carried off, I think. So I think that's my value now, being able to be there with the PNF when they discuss the things and then provide uh, a full report to the community and being able to explain what are the pros and the cons without taking side or ownership of things that I, I'm just there to analyze. So, well, I think that's it. I, I'm, I express myself better in the written format. <laughs> no, that's it. Great, thank you, Romero. Um, Fred, if you're here, please uh, quickly introduce yourself and then just yeah, say yeah. we're interested in this role too. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll go really fast. So um, I, I, I think it's a testament to this community that there are six just phenomenal candidates. Um, I don't think there's any wrong decision that can be made here. Uh, why am I interested in this? I am, uh, I, I think I differ from a lot of the names on this list in that I am a 100% doer. Uh, I'm not much of a talker. I am a data-driven decision maker, so I will absolutely echo on Ramiro. I've always been a data guy throughout my career, but um, I drive and I care about results more than anything. Um, so uh, why am I interested? I want to be uh, involved in the decision making and uh, drive towards meaningful and impactful decisions that move the ecosystem forward and uh, number go up. So that's me. Uh, my, I post my resume in the forum post. I mean, short and sweet. I, lo I love it. Thank you, Fred. Um, Bowen, uh, would, would love you to, to go next. Don't think I can hear you, Bowen, if you're speaking. Not that's just me. I can't hear him either. You are unmuted. So that's half the battle. Cool. Let's um, give Bowen a few, uh, hopefully 30 seconds or a minute or so to hopefully sort out his audio. Um, and yeah, that's all right. Olshansky would love you to 
quickly introduce yourself, although I'm sure you don't need any more introduction, but uh, it would be great. And just also just explain to everyone, yeah, why you're interested in the role. Oh, is that you speaking, Bon? Go. Hello. Okay, well, Shansi, go ahead. <laughs> uh, let, let's hand it off to Bon uh, since he got everything working. Hello, can you hear me? We can, yeah, yeah. we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, great to meet you here. So, um, a bit about myself. Um, previously, I was at Apple uh, doing AI and uh, machine learning stuff, uh, leading their uh, large language model inference team and data processing platform. Um, also spent some time at Alibaba US doing uh, real-time data processing with uh, Apache Foundation projects. Uh, so I have been working with and playing with the uh, blockchain RPC for a long time, and right now I'm uh, uh, an engineer lead at an Ethereum protocol called Eigenlayer. Um, so um, I've been following like Pocket Network's progress and uh, really impressed by what the community and the team has been doing uh, and your uh, commitment to the decentralized infrastructure vision. I'm even more excited about your expansion to the AI uh, inference world. Uh, I see lots of good synergy in there with on my personal uh, background. So uh, regarding how um, I fit this role, so first of all, I work with the blockchain RPC on a day-to-day -day basis. So that gives me a very user-centric perspective to understand where the pinpoint is and where the market demand is going. Um, and secondly, um, so throughout my career, I've been uh, practicing to you know, um, promote the awareness of projects and initiatives. Uh, especially in my Web2 uh, background, you know, I've been giving talks, writing blogs, tweets uh, to promote uh, new ideas or more fundamental ideas uh, for mass adoption. Um, I'm also kind of an outsider, so that can be a different perspective and can bring fresh insight into the Pocket Network community. Uh, and I think this is um upon talking to like Dermont and Ben, I think there's lots of like good partnership of this position um to be working with the board and also working with the community um to you know smooth the communication and also help the board to understand better you know what the trend is and um, providing some of the technical business advice, et cetera. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's a kind of brief intro of me and the motivation. Uh, great to meet you guys here. Brilliant. Thank you, Bowen. And Olshansky, last but very much not least. Yo, so, uh, for those that don't know, uh, I lead the protocol team at Grow. And what I wanted to do is kind of just take this as an opportunity to share some of my thoughts about why what we're building is so key and uh, why I think many underestimate the power of what we can do as an ecosystem. And then I'll lead into why I want to be a board observer. So kind of in my undergrad, I did a, a thesis in distributed systems and started studying economics. So uh, afterwards, so got into Ethereum uh, right around the right time, and back when Vitalik would still answer your questions and get her directly, uh, and you didn't realize how big all of it was going to be. Um, so all of this kind of started scaling up, and you know, even though I was in the crypto ecosystem for a while, I never really wanted to join it full time because none of the projects ever really appealed to me. Uh, and I didn't think they could have the real impact uh, outside of just Web3, but just on the entire real world. So it's kind of uh, fortunate that I met Mike uh, and was an early advisor for the project. But kind of jumping, <laughs> jumping forward several years, uh, joined Pocket 
the Pocket ecosystem full time uh, around late 2021. Uh, and what uh, what's really important to me is that gateways, even though I work at Grove, but I also spend a lot of time at the protocol, gateways can't work without the Pocket Network and Pocket Network can't work without gateways. Uh, and in order for us to really achieve our like vision as an ecosystem, I really, really believe in focus and spending our time and resources on the on the right things, whether that means financial resources, whether that means communication resources, whether that means focusing on the right partnerships. And almost daily, I talk to technical leaders from other projects uh, and kind of understand what's going on across the board. So given that I have a lot of visibility across the board, what I really want to do is, as a board observer, also help and focus uh, on the right things to really drive, uh, kind of focus on the right projects, focus on the right opportunities, and not uh, spend too much time on the things that we shouldn't. Uh, and I think holistically, that's how, you know, as an ecosystem, we can really achieve uh, the bigger vision that I don't think uh, most people really understand uh, uh, of what we're building here. I'll end it there. Awesome. Thank you to everyone. Uh, really appreciate everyone taking the time to introduce themselves and um, tell us all why you're excited. I think uh, I'm sure everyone enjoyed that. So thank you. Um, I'm very wary of time and there's a lot to get through. And so the next topic is on market liquidity. And this is referring to the forum post in the, yeah, the post in the forum about the proposal to take up to $3 million capped at 12.5 million pocket to deepen our liquidity and really make pocket a tier one project. Um, as this one is one of the bigger obstacles and more obvious weaknesses we have as a project when you look at us holistically. So please look into the forum, ask your comments, uh, add your comments, ask questions as much as you can. Feel free to DM me too. And while we have Matt on the call, I realize it's very late his time and I'm sure he'll have to jump off if he hasn't already fallen asleep. I'd love to introduce Matt from CoinWatch as he has been instrumental in advising us as part of this process. And actually CoinWatch's software will be extremely important to make sure once we get the very best terms um, for the DAO with new market makers that we actually hold them to account as too. So um, he's the expert and I'll, I'll let him introduce himself and maybe if we have time for one or two short questions while he's on the call, but um, he'll be able to answer questions on the forum too. So yeah, over to you, Matt. Thanks. Uh, hi guys. Yeah, this is Matt, the founder and the co-founder and CEO of, of CoinWatch. Um, I was a market maker for about 10 years uh, in traditional finance. Um, moved over to crypto uh, and joined CoinList uh, back in 2019. And this is where I started negotiating the negotiating market making deals for some of the, the big token sales that CoinList was running back then. So I negotiated the first Solana deal and Filecoin, Hello and Flow and Near and a few more. Um, and really developed uh, that expertise of uh, you know what market makers are doing in crypto, the good and the very bad. And um, uh, this really was the, the, the birth idea of, of CoinWatch. So CoinWatch today does, does two things. We negotiate better market making deals for our clients. Uh, and we keep market maker uh, accountable uh, in terms of providing the right liquidity and making sure that they don't misuse the tokens that they're being uh, uh, lent by by clients. Uh, we've been hired by some of the largest crypto projects that trusted us with uh, this process. Uh, Optimism, Blur, Blast, Worldcoin, Sui, Aptos, to name just a few. Uh, so yeah, we're recognized as the, the expert in that subject and we, we can drive the, the best bargain project to source uh, the best liquidity at the cheapest price and make sure that market makers um, stay honest and deliver what they promised. Fantastic. And I guess while Matt is here, does anyone um, want to ask him a question or two? Um, if not, I guess I'll hand it back to Zach. 
Um, let me know if it's like out of scope for this combo, but maybe it's worth talking about the difference between the funding ask and the market maker ask. Like the, we're asking for a large amount of funds, but they're not all going to the market maker, correct? They're going to provide liquidity. So, so all of the funds, the ask, yeah, so yeah, so yeah, add real clarity to that. We're asking for up to 3 million capping at 12.5 million pocket. The reason we don't have full clarity on the ask yet is because we're looking to run the market maker auction and negotiation process in parallel. Um, so that process will probably take another two weeks or so. Um, Matt can kind of give a better take on um, what he's seen in terms of the timing for the process. And at the end of that, we may it may end up being $2 million. It could be close to that three. It'll also be subject to how much pocket we get from the Dow. But then we're also getting bids for a retainer model as well as loan model. So we can figure out what is the exact best offer. We're assuming that a loan model is the best. Um, model in terms of getting the incentives right. But the idea is that, yes, that, that ask goes straight to market makers who deploy that as liquidity. But yeah, maybe that's the subtlety, Matt, if you want to talk about that, how not all of that liquidity is always in the books because it's ultimately subject to market volume, really, and how much you need to have in the books to serve that. So I think that's probably the question you're getting at, Zach, right? So in times of demand, you obviously need more in the books. In times of less demand, less volatility, you ultimately need less in the books. But the importance is that we're prepped for scale as well. And as uh, demand and volume for Pocket picks up and um, Pocket is added to more exchanges, ensuring that we have the uh, firepower to support that. So yeah, Matt, do you want to add anything onto that? Oh Yeah, that, that, that's exactly it. Um, we have uh, an expectation of what market makers are going to put. Uh, there is, you know, we can have a very cheap deal if we ask for little liquidity. But really what we're, to, what we're trying to do here is, is move the needle and give the liquidity that Pocket deserves to sustain its really high trading volume. Um, so will Market Maker quote a loan of $2, mil, $2 million, two and a half, three? We, we don't know yet. Uh, we can certainly adjust what we ask for in order to get the deal to where we want it to be, but it's, it's impossible for us to know right now um, to get you know, best in class liquidity and get pocket to where, where it, it should be versus its, its trading volume. Uh, yeah, we, we can say with certainty, this is what market makers are going to, are going to quote. Now we're going to involve about 10 to 12 market makers in this process, and they're all going to fight to win the pocket mandate. So one thing that we can be sure of is that whatever deal you guys end up signing will be the, the fair value for that deal really coming from the heavy competition of the top firms uh, in crypto to to win to win this mandate now the, you know let's say we end up with three million dollars worth of pocket uh, in loan this will not end up in the book this will not be you know you won't be seeing overnight uh, three million dollars within plus two percent uh depth in the order book it's it's used by the market maker to run their algorithms etc so um we are certainly going to try and get the maximum KPIs for the loan that you're going to extend. But yeah, the 100% of the assets are not going to end up in the order book. It's going to be fanned out to various exchanges. The more exchanges, of course, the, the less liquidity we can get because it just spreads out more uh, the, the working capital. And it also depends on, on trading volume. As Dermot says, uh, the higher the trading volume, ideally, we're going to see depth coming along with that. So the more tokens market maker are going to need to, to sustain that and to keep the books, uh, let's say, well fed and vice versa. If Bitcoin goes back to ten thousand dollars tomorrow, and trading volume comes off a cliff, uh, they won't be needing uh, the same amount of tokens. But one thing that we'll make sure to do is that the KPIs will be very dynamic, meaning they'll work in good and bad markets, and we'll be tracking that uh, the market maker deliver on 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 these KPIs uh, regardless of, of of price and volume. Awesome. Um, thank you, Matt. I, I think. Um, that's brilliant. And yeah, just to call out to everyone to please just ask questions, post in the forum. Um, would love to put this up for a vote soon. So um, you would definitely love some more feedback. And thanks, Matt. Appreciate your time. And I re realize it's pretty late your time. So uh, thanks for joining. You bet. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Dermot. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Um, okay. Uh, we're going to keep moving on, Shane. I'm giving a quick refresh, reshare for you here.
Whenever you're ready, Shane. Cool, cool. Yeah, so uh, short and sweet. Uh, most important items are uh, which is uh, Is that coming through? Let me see if I can stop that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure if that was coming Yeah, from. sorry. I think that's just part of my computer now. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, yeah, Pup, Pup 33 is now up for vote. This is what uh, Oshansky uh, submitted, and it is a solution to uh, scaling uh, Morse until we get to Shannon. Uh, I, I repeat, it is up for a vote, so folks should uh, go vote ASAP. Uh, this is very important. Uh, for uh, securing scalability until Shannon. Uh, what it does is it increases the block size uh, incrementally. First, it's going to uh, be bumped up to 12 and then the 16. So that gives more space to have more gateways uh, and more chains on the network, while it's also increasing the minimum number of proofs from 10 to uh, 500. So this is important because uh, it's also reducing the amount of uh, bloat in the block size itself. So we're kind of tackling it from two angles. We're making it more efficient uh, and we're uh, making the block size larger. So very important to do this. We have a lot of uh, cool stuff come down in, in uh, uh, with gateways and we want to make sure that we can scale. So go check that vote out. Uh, as a quick update, actually just yesterday we pushed a update for Node Wallet. Uh, I know a lot of folks use Node Wallet in the Pocket ecosystem. Uh, and what we did is we made it uh, possible for people to put in their own Pocket RPC endpoints. Uh, right now there is a default Grove endpoint, uh, but uh, you know folks can swap it for another endpoint or for their own Node. Uh, basically leave it up to the user. Uh, you can do that for both uh, testnet and uh, mainnet. Uh, so if you if you you know if it looks like there's some kind of issue with the wallet or if it's showing zero or something like that, that is an issue with the endpoint. So I would suggest uh, you know putting in a, a different endpoint or something of that nature to address that issue or wait until it's back online. Um, regarding Shannon, uh, everything is about testnet right now. Uh, we have a private testnet uh, expecting to launch by next week. I technically tomorrow, but I, you know, just wanted to uh, give a little bit of leeway just in case. But uh, by next week, we will have a fully functioning uh, private testnet. Um, now, this will be permissioned, and it's meant to test specific features uh, that the protocol team has been building. Um, they need a, a larger test environment uh, and more actors to kind of pull the tests that they need to start pulling. Uh, and so it will be permissioned, uh, this round will be permissioned, uh, and then we will progressively increase the number of users to the private test net. So first we're going to start with node runners and we might add some uh, folks that are able to uh, simulate gateways and things of that nature. So we'll be progressively adding some folks to the uh, test net. We've already gotten a lot of people reaching out saying, hey, we want to be a part of test net. And I can't tell you how awesome it is to really have an exciting community that's reaching out saying we want to uh you know run stuff and, and and help test stuff so we're really in a great position um and we want to uh ultimately then get to the public test net which is where a lot of the uh where where things really start to open up so that is going to be late to mid-april um or mid to late april and uh this is going to be permissionless actors so this is the kind of test net where anyone anyone can join uh, however, with just the understanding that, you know, things will still be evolving, uh, especially on the tokenomics and uh, some other features might be evolving. So uh, just be aware that uh, it'll be permissionless and anyone can join. But, uh, you know, Shannon, people can start building for Shannon. But just be aware that some things might change in terms of maybe uh, some of the data and things of that nature with uh, uh, what's going to be evolving on the tokenomics and future front. So that's the product update. Thank you, Shane. Uh, appreciate the update and a quick shout out to my mom who loves to call during community office hours. So sorry about the beeping. As I'm going to move on through to you, tell us about the Lego Mixer. 
Um, so we had a, a great a great event in Denver. We had really, really good attendance. Um, so we had an event that had a capacity of 300. We had well over a thousand signups. We had um, almost 600 kind of coming at various points during the day, which wasn't bad given that we, we actually only waitlisted 600 uh, or 620 by the time we added, added friends back in. Um, we executed it with a, a range of partners across Deepin, um, which was wonderful in terms of kind of strengthening relationships. And there are lots of conversations about co-marketing that we can do together and, and working together again. Um, everyone said they want to be involved again if we do it. Um, this idea of kind of Lego was a really nice icebreaker. It was a great way to get people talking. It was a great way to kind of talk about that, that, you know, idea of kind of building together and building layers and this we had actually branded base layers I don't have any of them on here because they all got nicked um lego flew like you know by the end of the event a lot of the little pieces that we decorated things with we staged scenes so we had like you know we had a little dgens district with lego lambos um one lego lambo that I actually borrowed off my son uh, that had some wheels missing and we kind of scrawled wrecked across the bonnet even that got taken um, I saw this, the lady in the picture here at the top left, um, that was actually not even at our event. That was at an event later in the week um, at one of the boys club events. Um, I saw this person turn up in our, our Lego glasses, um, which was kind of cool. Uh, so it was a really, really strong proof of concept. It was a great chance to strengthen our relationships across the ecosystem. The talks were awesome. So there were some really solid talks we had. Um, you know, some great speakers. We had a great panel on AI. We had a great panel um, around kind of values and growth. Um, we had a great panel around real world adoption. And um, and then we had a really good hero panel around, you know, deep in itself and why people were getting excited about it. So it was a great chance to kind of share our narratives alongside some, some awesome partners um, with an audience of devs. You know, I think one of the things I noticed very much this time from you know, when I was at ECC back last July, just after joining the project, um, last time I felt like when I when I said Pocket Network to people, I kind of got kind of vaguely quizzical looks, or I got kind of you know, oh yeah, I'm sure I've heard of it. And this time, like you know, going around the conference, and I don't think it was just this event. I think it's all the all the good work that everyone has been doing. Um, but it felt like people really knew what we were doing, and we're starting to to kind of have a bit more excitement. So. It was lovely to have everybody together and and to enjoy that. So, yeah, it was a great event. We hope to do the next one around ETHCC again next July. Um, and we will keep you guys posted kind of, you know, it feels like a really, a really good activity, particularly around awareness and consideration amongst that developer audience, but also really good in terms of strengthening the marketing across the the deep in space and making sure that we are in those convos i don't know whether or not we did have a quick video that we posted on telegram i don't know if you can see it but um yeah if you haven't seen that already take a look oh, in fact here it is There you have it. Handing back to you, Zach. Thanks, Ads. Yeah, it was such an awesome event, and it was so great to see so many faces uh, after spending all this time on Discord with many people and just their PFPs. Um, it was great to actually meet you all in person or meet many of you in person. So really looking forward to the next one in 
Belgium. Oop. Well, there we go. All right. Over to the offsite. Uh, Dermot, do you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. And yeah, please do jump in, Zach and Ads, and uh, anyone else from PNF on the call, yeah, Sh Shane and so on. Um, yeah, to build on what Ad said earlier, I do think one of the biggest differences, I mean, there's many differences in terms of where the market is from. 12 months ago, but PNF had its first in-person gathering at Eat Denver um, last year. And at many of the events we went to and dinners and so on and so forth, explaining Pocket and telling people about Pocket, not a lot of people cared or even knew what we're about. I think once you go deeper, they were interested, but um, that recognition or consideration definitely wasn't there. And it was really different this time around, like really notable leaders from major projects are holding pocket interested in pocket want us to win um yeah it was, it was really cool to see and uh yeah it's, it's really exciting to think about that blatant support that is that is ultimately there um and behind the scenes um but yeah to bring it back to to our offsite i think the the great world of um remote working works really well for when you do it well in terms of async and having all this brilliant talent come together but meeting pe people in person for creativity, deeper bonds just can't be beaten and for going that bit deeper. And so we, as a team, aim to get together. I think we're aiming for roughly three times a year around major events. And so our last one was in Barcelona just before DevConnect um, in November. And yeah, this time we met for a few days in Boulder and we always set together an agenda and have some objectives up front. And this time we were talking through our aim was to kind of really define and get clarity around what a successfully scaled ecosystem looks like. And the the context there is last year was really about getting our shit in order um, and getting ready for scale. And this year is about scale and enabling that exponential growth. And you can see that across our technology, our culture, our business, every, everything is what we're thinking about. And um, that, of course, requires a, a gaps analysis, um, understanding from first principles what else we'd like to do, what else will drive the most value, thinking about the trade-offs, and then putting together a plan and budget. So um, if we want to go to the next slide, Zach. So the way, the takeaway for us as we look to define um, where we need to get to is we need to become tier one. That's what we need. And the, the building blocks as part of that, um, what we aligned on were these four elements. So having a killer vision and narrative um, that can excite and rally people, um, capital and attention, and ultimately align people around what needs to be built as well. Um, the talent and performance density to pull this off, the operational excellence to enable this and make sure it's scalable. Um, we don't just become suckers to coordination costs and uh, yeah, the curse of Moloch. And of course, customer obsession, which I, th I think is... It's something so important and so obvious. However, once you think of things through a user-centric frame, it can really change your perspective. Um, and that's been really instrumental, I think, when we're thinking through our tokenomics and user experience for all of our stakeholders, both our suppliers, our gateways, um, mm. and everyone else in the pocket ecosystem. So if you want to quickly go to the next slide, Zach. So this is just quickly the flash up as part of this process. Um, I think early on the first day, we were thinking through other projects that we think have done at least one of those four elements really well, whether it's kind of the operational element, the customer obsession, the the killer narrative, and of course, the, the talent and performance density. And we pulled that together and we looked at where the gaps in power. And if you go to the last slide, um, also, yeah, where we have time, we realized these are some of the additional elements that can enable Pocket to become tier one. And for clarity, all of this builds, builds on everything else we've planned um, as part of our ecosystem strategy and the era strategy. Um, but these are the additional areas we really realize we need to activate the immediate PNF team, but also the whole ecosystem around. And so, yeah, I guess this is kind of um, what we're really excited by. We feel Becoming tier one is is tangible. It's uh, we're we're not there yet, but um, there is a clear pathway there. And as part of this, we want to make sure the community fully understands how they can get involved. This will be part, partly through RFPs, how we're improving our documentation, 
just how we're ensuring capital and support goes to all of the people who can drive impact um, for our ecosystem. And everything in this is is fully funded already from the era budget. It's actually more of a part diversion of uh, focus um, from the team to help support, but also um, from the the various mechanisms within the DAO already, such as the the quick grants and the RFP buckets, which come from the the DAO take as well. So um, I'll pause there and ask if anyone has any questions. And sorry, the one quick caveat, of course, is the only proposal that wasn't included in this. Um, at least then there may be a couple of other RFPs, but I think largely it's coming from the Euro budget is the liquidity debt piece, which is obviously the, the proposal that talks about or that's in the form that that just we didn't have enough budget in the Euro budget to cover that, but everything else, my, my understanding is coming from the Euro budget. So yeah, I'll pause there because um, it covered a lot of different elements um, and wondering if anyone has any questions around the approach, the idea of what it means to become tier one for pocket and even if they have any thoughts or are kind of inspired or provoked by that kind of uh challenge for for pocket to become tier one and any other areas they would like to see or um are excited about pocket um doing or enabling across the community hey dermot fred asks yes. how do you measure whether pocket is tier one or not i think this is a great question but it's it's similar to what is impact and it's ultimately subjective and those projects we looked at earlier usually no using those four elements using these projects which a lot of them we thought were projects and companies um often they were tier one on at least two of those four elements um the kind of killer vision the operational excellence the customer obsession and you need to be good enough or very good on the others so um yeah we can we can definitely share more thinking on our gaps i think that's probably a good idea that we do but um i think it's one of those things just like product market fit it's like you can't give a explicit definition but the market pulls it out of you and you just know um everyone really wants you and you just know when you're there essentially um i don't think there's one clear definition and it's it's subjective enough that enough people need to believe it not just one kind of cohort of stakeholders or a particular group and that's why we it's multifaceted, right? So we need to improve our technology, our community mechanisms, our capital markets, everything we think about our onboarding, supply demand, um, our governance, our community processes, and just kind of even onboarding additional talent. So it's it's multifaceted, which means it's not easy. However, we feel that a lot of this is now in our control, which um, certainly gives us a lot of confidence about um, what we can do over the course of the, the rest of this year. Does anyone else from the team add Zach, um, Shane? Yeah, but I think is Jack here. Um, ben is asleep given the Australian time, but does anyone else want to jump in and give their thoughts on one, the offside or yeah, two, actually just this idea of becoming tier one and kind of what's ahead of us? You can definitely talk a little bit about, um, yeah, I just want to do a, a shout out. You know, Shane has recently joined the team, but has uh, brought a ton of, perspective and like knowledge from from being in the community for so long that I think was really invaluable here and I think we we're missing coming into this offsite. So a big shout out to Shane and all the work that he's done over the last I mean really it's only been like a month and a half but um definitely feeling kind of an acceleration coming from his input here. Um and I I did miss part of the first day but I feel like Shane was pretty instrumental in in helping lay out a lot of the the protocol or technical aspects that we need to get to for tier one and really helping us align around that. So I, I guess this is just another big shout out to say, Shane, thank you for, for stepping up and, and providing that kind of perspective from uh, the community and technology side that we weren't getting. Bingo. Yeah, this was a, a, a really cool, a really cool event. Um, you know, I, I just started, uh, contracting for PNF, helping with uh, project management on the protocol side. And um, yeah, it was really helpful to uh, kind of get together. And uh, I believe, uh, I forget who, I, I forget who exactly brought it, but but the concept of being a tier one um, may have been Ben. Uh, like what, you know, what is becoming a tier one, which gave a lot of 
allowed us to focus, uh, you know, take a, a focused approach to each of these elements inside the ecosystem. And so, um, yeah, I, I really, I really enjoyed it. The, the thing that I really walked away with was the customer obsession, um, you know, thinking through the each element of, of these customers, who are they, what's motivating them, uh, and, you know, kind of in that, a lot of great talks with folks about tokenomics or, uh, you know, Shannon and things of that nature. So um, currently I'm getting kind of everything together and, and creating a one pager of, of what the migration would look like and what, uh, uh, what a, uh, the tokenomics can look like so that we can get some discussions going. Um, but uh, yeah, so hopefully uh, I expect next week I'll be publishing something uh, for people to start looking at, which correlates with the pi private testnet uh, as we're also getting some of the technical sides starting tested. So good, a uh, lot of cool momentum happening and it was cool to be able to uh, talk about these kind of things in a face-to-face -face way and, and kind of come out with a, a, a direct strategy for becoming a tier one project. Great, thank you, Shane. Um, Worry of time as well, but does anyone have any questions or add to add to if there's anything else you might want to add before we uh, wrap up and hand it back to Zach? Nothing to add. Um, it's always great to to be able to sit together and think about the future, and I think that hopefully the community will see the the results from that over the coming weeks and months. Um, we look forward to your continued feedback as we as we work through that. Great. Yeah, thanks, Dermot, Ad, Shane, uh, Ben in spirit as well. Um, I guess that wraps it up for, for this community call. Um, as always, you can take those conversations or ideas to the forum or to the Discord. Um, and if you do have any feedback, we're always open for, for direct DM. So thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks, all.